Well, we are celebrating Father's Day, and I do, uh, as Esther mentioned earlier, one of the exciting things is we're starting to see a shift back in the church to where men are actually coming back into the church and accepting the responsibility that God has placed upon them. And that is a blessing if you don't realize that. Um, you know, generations in the past, have, 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 men have failed, or I don't want to say failed, that's a bad word, have come short on accepting the responsibility that God has placed on them. And so the women of the church have had to step up in order to take leadership and in order to take, you know, to, to pick up where men have dropped the ball. And this morning, as Father's Day, I, you know, of course, am speaking from personal experience on both good and bad. I wish I could say I was the perfect shining example of a father. My kids would laugh at that point. But I've had a lot of good experience with it and also the experience of what my dad has put me through in life. But Father's Day, is, if we take the understanding, I went through a lot of scriptures trying to figure out which one would be fitting for this morning. And, you know, there's so many, there are so many scriptures out there about fathers. You realize that? The responsibility that God has given us as fathers is, is mind-blowing at times. And sometimes the burden which we carry is, is terrifying also. The one scripture that really stood out to me was in Proverbs 22.6. Most of you may know. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not return from it. If I could give you any advice as a father today is to really take this, this scripture in mind, in the heart. The fact is, is our responsibility as men is to train up our children, to train them up in the way that the Lord See, even all throughout Proverbs, all throughout the New Testament, there's scripture after scripture that talks about the responsibility that we have to train up a next generation. And so really the first point that I want to make is the responsibility that God is calling us as men to be the spiritual head of the household. Now, this is not to say that to be the spiritual dictator of the household. This is to take the idea, uh, you know, to love your wife, to love your kids, to train up your kids, to accept responsibility as Christ has created us to be the spiritual heads of our households. Now, if we drop that ball as men, then guess who picks it up? Our wives. And I'm going to tell you this morning, it's not fair for the woman to have to pick up that responsibility. Men, this is where we start to agree. The reality, I'm surprised that I haven't had more women going amen yet. But we are called to be the spiritual head of the household. Now, what does that mean? We hear that term a lot. We, we, we understand scripture talks about it. What does it mean? Well, in a, in a nutshell, it says anything that has to do with the spiritual condition of your family is your responsibility. Now, that right there is terrifying for any father to take on. Because the fact is, is we're not perfect, right? You know, I, I want to look at the person beside you and say, you know what, I'm not perfect this morning. And then the other one look at him and say, I know. All right, we're, we're trying to get some energy back in here. I don't know what it is this morning. It feels like a, a heavy, damp rag. Now, just to give you a little bit of information, tonight, I'm sorry, I meant to announce this earlier. Tonight, being Father's Day, we will not have service. We want you to go spend time with your fathers. Um, visit them, go spend time. You know, we don't want you to have to rush around, but we want you to go enjoy time with your, your parent, your father this, this evening. But as fathers, we are called to be the spiritual head of the household. Now, to take that idea, I want us to think about this. First of all, Fathers, one thing that we have a tendency to do, we have a tendency to expect our kids just to understand. You know, we, we have this idea, we really want them to understand that we love them, we always care for them, but see, as men, it's hard to express emotion, right? Some, I, you know, some people are better at it than others. I, I'm more analytical, I fall in an analytical column. I expect people to just to understand because that's the way it's supposed to be, right? One plus one is two. So the problem with that is our kids don't always understand that. So I challenge you to this idea this morning. Instead of just assuming that your kids understand it, actually get verbal with them. Talk to them. You know what? Get in a covenant with them and tell them that you will love them no matter what. It's okay. Because no matter what means that as Christ loved the church, so we will love them also. 
Now, I know Scripture says, well, Christ, you know, love, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And please let me explain something about that. I'll get to it in a minute. But the reality is our relationship with our wives is the first priority. You know, our relationship with God, our relationship with our wives, and our relationship with our kids. In that order. Now, the reality is, is if we express love to our wives as Christ, as Christ loved the church, then a love for our children is going to come naturally, right? Right? And so it's okay to tell your kids, you know what? You're going to drive me nuts at some point. You're going to push me to the edge. You're going to push the buttons you love to push. Hint, hint. Anyways, <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble this morning. But, <laughs> but it's okay. Because no matter what you do, you're still my child. No matter what, I'll love you. I may not agree with all the choices you make in life. I may not, uh, I may not support you in the areas. Uh, you know what? There might be times where I withdraw my support so that you can have a little tough love. It's okay. Understand, no matter what, as a prodigal son is a great illustration of this. The father trained both of these kids in the same upbringing. They were raised in the same picture. One made a decision to run from home with all the riches that he had and go squander it. The other stayed home. But see, what's so neat about this picture, this illustration, is the father had equal love for both kids. The one that was present and the one that wasn't. So much so, the illustration I get of this father daily walking out to the road looking just in case his son might come home. A love and a compassion that a father has for his kids needs to be equal to. See, one thing in America we've run into is mothers have been so lifted up to this idea that men are just like, well, we can never compare to that. Even a, one of the chief justices shared that we have to convince men that raising a child is an important part of being a man. But the reality is it's easy for women because that's what we're naturally, your, your mother's instincts, you know, and please, you know, you ever see the football player on TV? They don't ever go, hey, dad. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> that's what they always say. But the reality is that father, as he waits for his son to return, is a compassion. We need to have compassion on our kids. We need to provide them spiritual covering. You know what? As spiritual head of the household, we need to pray for our kids. We need to pray and never stop praying, folks. I am a testimony to that prayer. My mom, as I was wandering away from God, never stopped praying. Oh, every once in a while, she would browbeat me, and that's okay. And every once in a while, she would tell me, you know, you're doing wrong. It's okay. But you know what actually stuck in my head more than anything? The thing that really brought me back to the moment on my knees before God. When in my time of need, I needed God. I, you know what the image was? It wasn't my mom's prayers. I, I, I love the prayers of my mom. Don't get me wrong. But it was a day. It was a Sunday morning where the preacher got up and delivered a message. I didn't have a clue what he preached on because I was a teenager sitting in the back row playing around. It's okay, guys, I know. <laughs> but an altar call came up. See, we had four altars in our front. We had two at an angle and two in the center. And I'm sitting in back, and of course, as you, know, you hear, well, people responding, so teens go, who's that? Who is it? Yeah. I saw my dad. See, my dad was a master chief in the Navy. I was raised in a very strict household. You know, it was not, you know, people say yes, sir, no, sir. It was never no, sir. It was yes, sir. We never said no, sir, because we just simply did what he told us to do. But that big, strong man, my father. See, I was the type of kid that believed my dad could beat up any other dad in the world. He was a, he was a strong man. But that day he came up in the outside aisle to church. He made his way up, and of course now my attention is being, being grasped to this whole idea. I'm curious now what's going on. And he made his way up. It wasn't in the outside pew or altar, it was the inside altar. He knelt down, and see, my dad was one. He, he, my dad was great at expressing love to us, don't, don't get me wrong. He was, but he was very hard on the outside, but once you got past that. But he knelt down, and he began to weep. 
And I'm not talking about just a little tear in the eye. I, I'm talking about almost a gut wrenching. You know, you heard the heaves in his and in, in him crying out to God. And I, I my curiosity made me come down to the second row and, and to, to watch. See, my dad came to know the Lord. And one of the life changing things that happened at that point is he came to know the Lord personally. He knew. See, I was about 15 at that time. And I was, I was living my life somewhat decent for God. But I saw this big, strong man be broken before God. Now, some would say, well, that's a weak person. Well, man, I'll tell you right now, there's no one stronger than God. And you want to express to your kids the love? Let them see the love that you have for God in your life. Let them bear witness to it. Because that day when Courtney's life was on the edge and I didn't know what to do, the only thought in my mind was this God who is big enough to break my dad must be big enough to take care of this too. I saw by example what it meant to be broken before God. I saw what it meant in my life, in my moment of need. My dad was the spiritual covering that I needed. He was praying for me. My mom was praying for me. My dad, all of them were there praying for me when I wandered away from God. My dad was always there to be a friend, to be an ear. Oh, my dad and I were so much alike, we butted heads a lot. Oh, don't think you're the only, I'm the only one that does that. But we're so much alike. But one thing that my dad was good about is giving hugs. My dad, every Christmas, no matter what it was, if there was an emotional moment, he just wanted it, he would give us a hug and tell us he loved us. And so by living an example of what it means for God in your life, your kids, you know what? Here's the reality. You can't hide anything from your children. It's okay. They're going to see it. Now, I didn't get any amens on that one because you know what? That then means we're accountable for our actions. We're accountable to what God is holding us to. You know what? Here's an idea. Provide guidance for your kids by example more than words. How many have ever heard, do as I say, not as I do? Come on, we've all heard it at one time or another. But the reality is God is on the other side, says, do as you say you're going to do and quit talking about it. Is that OK? The fact is, as guys, you know, I have I, being an analytical person, something I've always had to learn over the years is how to deal with emotion, because I have three daughters and a wife. It's Mike and I against the world. The emotional roller coasters. Oh, Lordy. They get difficult sometimes. You're sitting there going, well, you're just smiling. Why are you crying? I, I, this struggles for me. But I had to learn. I had to learn that, you know what? Some things I'm not going to have the answer for. But the one thing I can do is just love them no matter what. I can pour my love out no matter what. Now, let me ask you a question here. Is this not everything we would hope God is to us? You know, he is the spiritual father. So we learn by example. He's compassionate. He's loving. He's, uh, he's forgiving. He's all, you know, he never, he, <laughs> agape love. He never stops loving. Even when we deny him. Even when we turn from him. He's still longing for us to be with him. But to live a life by example is set, you know what, set your priorities in line. And then you know what's so funny to me is I, I sit back and I watch men, they, they show priority over here, and then they start demanding their kids to show the proper priorities. Why? You haven't trained them how to show the proper priorities in life. Oh boy, we're getting quiet now. But so many times... We mix up our priorities, but we expect our kids to have them right. 
You know, it, it goes back to the living, you know, give guidance by example more than just words. Words are, are critical. Don't get me wrong. If you ever want to see a kid and in this day and age, it's, it's becoming more common and it terrifies me more and more. But this is where the church steps in. We have kids being raised that never hear a positive word in their life. Mom and dad are breaking them down every word, every day. Teachers are telling them, some teachers, I'm not saying all of them, there are some of them out there, because I'm good ones, by all means. But the thing is, they're never hearing a positive word to lift them up. And so when we get an opportunity to get them in a church, don't browbeat them and tell them what they're doing wrong. Tell them what, how God loves them. Tell them how you love them. Again, an example of a man in a church, J.D. Barefoot, was a name that I will never forget as long as I'm alive. Because no matter what I was doing, even running in the church, running in the sanctuary, playing around in the church, getting in trouble in the church, guess what J.D. Barefoot would tell me? He says, God loves you and so do I. And he didn't just say the words, he showed the words. He lived it. He would grab me and give me a hug every time I saw J.D. Barefoot made an impact in my life. Words are critical. Lift your kids up. Tell them how great they are. Oh, I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. But you know what? Words can, you know, there's a song, words can build you up, words can break you down. Words are critical. Also, establish a relationship with your kids that nothing's off limits when it comes to talking. One thing I did as a youth pastor, and I've been called on this before, the fact is I told the kids, listen, if you're out and you find yourself in a situation where you made a bad choice and you're drunk, don't drive home. Call me. Youth pastor, yes. Call the youth pastor. I will come and get you. I will notify your parents that you're safe. And the next day, I'll be there for you to have the conversation. You know what? I've had kids do that over the years. And it's okay. We have to be willing to talk to our kids about whatever they need to talk about. Even if it embarrasses you or makes you uncomfortable. You know what, folks? If we don't teach our kids right, the world will teach them wrong. So we've got to start speaking truth into the lives of our kids. Let them see the importance of Christ in our lives. Let them hear the words on how Christ defeated Satan. Let them hear the importance. Raise up your child so they may know. Be strong and courageous. Don't teach your kids this. Teach your kids this. This is so critical. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you. Put that into their lives early. Speak it regularly. Let them know. Let them know the importance that God is in yours and their lives. Another area that we can work on, especially, this is more prevalent to me now in life than I've ever been in. Men, let your kids see how you treat your wife. Do you hear me? Now, first of all, it means are you treating your wife right? It says to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That does not say we're dominators over. It does not say we're dictators over. It says that, as a matter of fact, in Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's easy to stand here and ask the question and say, how many men would, st would lay their life down for their wives? And all the men would yeah, that's the manly thing to do. That's what I would do. But are you speaking truth into her life? Are you living a life pleasing? Or is your marriage... You know, it's hard. Because there's days we get upset. There's days we don't want to. But when all comes to be said, I'm pretty sure there was a day that Christ didn't want to hang on that cross. I'm pretty sure there were days that, by all rights, he didn't want to be here on earth. It says that we're supposed to love our lives as Christ loved the church, right? And laid his life down. 
I started something many years ago. And I, I think I've mentioned this to a couple of young, your fathers with younger kids. Something I did years ago is I started dating my daughters. Daddy-daughter dates. It wasn't just the day that the school had when they had the father-daughter dance. But it's daddy-daughter date. It was days that I would call from the office. I know Jessica. I'd call from the office. I'd show up with flowers on the doorstep. I would knock on the door. And, and Mom would, Esther would ask us in and, and ask us where we're going. What time will we plan on being there? What's the plan and what time do you plan on being home? We were establishing in them what the expectation was when it came time for them to start dating. Oh, they didn't do 100% correct. But you know what? To this day, I can still say they're doing better. <laughs> but I started doing that and that did something that allowed my girls to talk to me it started off we'd go to McDonald's for a Happy Meal now it's Red Lobster <laughs> Whew, it gets expensive as they get older but I also when we went to go on these dates we would, I would open a door for them I'd pull their seat out for them I'd show them what I as a father wanted to see as a man that was going to date her. I don't know if she remembers. There was one day we were outside washing the car in Texas and some boy rode by and started hooting and hollering at her because she was wearing a bathing suit. I, oh, Lordy, I know. But she was wearing a bathing suit while washing the car. And I looked at her and she walked off over to the guy and began to talk to him. I'm thinking, girl, I thought I trained you better than that. Because I'm glad you talked to him because I'm about to go kill the boy. But she came back and I, and I said, what would you say? She goes, well, I told him that, you know what, I'm more valuable than that. She said, I don't know if you remember that or not. We raise our kids. See, this is one thing I'm going to kind of transition to. We are, how do I put this? The breaker of generation barriers or generational sins. How's that sound? As men, we are to be the generational breakers. And by that, what I mean is the fact that there are times that there, you know, we're all raised with some background. The way our fathers treated or the way our mother. It's been proven over years and years that someone who is raised around abuse will either naturally accept abuse or become the abuser. It's been proven time and time again. But until such time as there is a break in that generational tradition. And that break is, comes when a man gets on his face before God and cries out for the change in his life. Boy, you guys aren't getting excited this morning. Because the reality is, is that if we don't ever come to that moment, then we're just going to pass from us to the next generation. If, you are a, if you're a verbal abuser, guess what your kids are going to raise to be? Verbal abusers or someone who's willing to accept verbal abuse? If you have a tradition of, you know what? Atheism in your family. Whatever it may be. Maybe it's alcoholism. My, my grandfather on my mom's side was an alcoholic. Oh, you know, I pay real close attention to that. Because that could very easily fall, show up in my family line again. But the fact is, is I'm adamantly teaching against it. I'm adamantly teaching the truth of Scripture. The truth of what God wants of us. Men, we're called to this responsibility. But let me tell you what, the greatest joy. The greatest joy I have as a father. I've been blessed to baptize each one of my kids. I've been blessed to watch them being raised up. Oh, they're making their days. They're made, there's times where they stray away a little bit. But you know what? There's nothing more beautiful than when they come back. I feel many times as a prodigal father, as father, the prodigal son, standing there looking and hoping. Standing there looking and hoping. Oh, he's straying away. She's straying away. Maybe. Lord, please. Please. That's a burden, guys, we're supposed to be carrying. Your wife is supposed to be the prayer support for you. She's supposed to encourage you and lift you and support you. But we're supposed to carry the burden of our children. 
I know we don't like that. That's hard. But there's no greater joy than when you have your child come to accept Jesus in their lives. Whether a little child at an altar, oh man, I, those, those, those kill me. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just a crying mess when a, baby, when a child comes up here. Or maybe it'll be a year later on in life in the years when they're older. But at some point, at some point, where it says train the child in the way he should go. If we truly train our kids in the way of the Lord, if we truly support them, not just speak the words, but live the life, if we encourage them to speak and we speak truth in their life, we encourage them, we lift them up, we support them, even when they're falling down, we pick, help pick them up. We do, folks, I, you know, we never stop. We never stop. Dads, never stop. Never give up. It may be frustrating. Your kids may be pushing to the edge. They may be aggravating you. You may want to strangle them. It's okay. Never give up. Because God's word is true. Right? I want to read just a few scriptures that I really enjoyed this week. I've read a couple. And be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord God is with you. Joshua 1.9. These commandments I give you and press them on your children. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and I want you to catch this, and for their children will be a refuge. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you are doing in our lives. Lord, I pray right now for each father that is here. Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage. Lord, so many times society says we're supposed to be tough. We're supposed to not show emotion. But Lord, I pray that the men would learn to love you in such a way. Lord, that they would not be afraid to show the love they have for you to their kids. Don't let arrogance and pride get in the way of the teaching of the truth. Lord, I thank you for every father here this morning because they have begun to make that commitment. Some have begun, some have done it for many years. Lord, we see generations here represented this morning. And Lord, all we can say is glory to God. We thank you for the examples that we've had in our past. I pray, Lord, for the children of our community who don't have those godly examples, Lord. I pray that in some way our church would be a place that they can find the hope, Lord. A place that they can find encouragement. A place where we can lift them up. Lord, I pray that we could be a place that they can know is safe. Lord, I ask right now that you would bless this church. We thank you for those kids downstairs right now. Lord, there's no greater joy than to, to see the numbers we tease about it, Lord. It seems like half the congregation leaves every Sunday. But Lord, we thank you for those kids. We thank you for the wild children. We thank you for the loudness. We thank you for the noise. Lord, we thank you because without them, we have no future. Help us to be the example, Lord, to them. I pray, Lord, that we would be the example of what it means to be godly men and, and women. May the children look upon us and see the truth of what your word speaks. Now, Lord, as we close this time together, I pray that we would have a day of relaxation in your presence. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's lost contact with their father, I pray today, Lord, that they would make every effort. Lord, sometimes the hardest part is to say, Dad, would you forgive me? But I'm sure, Lord, that any father who has a child lost is waiting for that call. Go with us, Lord, and give us strength. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.